Hi, I'm Dean, and this is part of our Learn No Lunch series. And this is a great question we got from uh, an email this week. So we'll just start it off. The Learn No Lunch. Now, apparently, three out of four people make up 75% of the population. 50% of all experts are wrong. And why am I telling you this? Because what I want you to know is we're going to present to you the best information and what we believe to be true and will work best for you. But you are the final judge on whether our recommendations are going to work for you. So we're presenting this in the best we can for, for your consumption. Now, we got this letter. I am looking to finish my basement this winter and came across this product. Yay, this product is in so fast. It looks like it will save me a lot of time, money, versus the standard 2x4 installation. Well, we couldn't agree more. He goes on, I have a question though. In my basement, where the cinder block meets the sill plate, there is either an indentation of about an inch or a slant. What was great about this particular email is he sent two pictures with it. And the two pictures really helped me figure out what would work, what I think would work best for, for, for you. Now, now here it is. Here is the concrete block, the floor joist overhead, the floor joist overhead, I only have 83 inches. So I gather means 83 inches, this is the top, and to the floor it's 83 inches high. The cinder block only goes up to 75 inches, and that would be this 75 inch line, where the slant starts to indent close to three inches. So it tapers back three inches, and this is only, only the inch area. The sill plate, that's this right here, is at, the sill plate all start at 80 inches at least. So he has a 80 inch line right here, 83 inches right there, and this is sort of a transitional line. So as you can see in this picture, where the concrete tapers back, it goes up to the sill plate, and the floor joist is right up, right up above, and the floor, the first floor floor is right above that. So this is kind of a nice detail with the straps going across for the drywall attachment. That's good, and I guess this was the original drywall furring strips right there. And you can see a random electric wire. So his question is, how do I finish off this area? Because I imagine the insofast would run straight across, and there's this three-inch gap that he's, that he's worried about. So we, we do this a lot. We get that question a lot, and it is this transition where the concrete block wall ends and where the floor joists and this whole transitional area starts to kick in. How do I handle that? He's worried about a big gap up in here and how do you insulate it? Now, what I will tell you, and probably more important than insulating your basement walls, would be to air seal and insulate the rim joist up there. That's the number one air leak in a house. Concrete doesn't move, it's, well, it's a stone. Wood, 
it's a natural product that swells and grows with heat and humidity and time of year. If you ever notice your, your floors in the winter are kind of squeaky and in the summer you don't hear them quite as much. So the kids are yelling and the doors are open. But the wood swells and shrinks. That's the reason we built wood boats is because the wood would swell and keep the water out once it, it hit its maximum tightness. So that's always changing. So if you air seal that, your house is like a chimney and the warm air rises and the cold air s is sucked up right in through there. So that transition is really important. And we have a, in our technical area under interior, you can get a um, rim joist, I think it's number 16, uh, quick link. And there's a really good article on how to handle that but I don't want to handle all of that right now. Let's go to this particular uh, setup and switch to this camera view. So what we want you to do is insulate this area up in here. Fill in insulation. If, if, this, if, if it was your area, it would be tapered paper insulate. You can spray foam that wood, air, wood joist area up in there, but it is okay for the insofast to actually go up and above and all the way, all the way to your floor joist. There we go. All the way to your floor joist, because this is a stud. That, it, that is a stud. This stud is buried into that panel, and if you butt that up right up against the roof and go to a lumber supply store and get a metal L angle like this, and you screw that into the insofast stud and adjust it for the floor, the ceiling height, screw it in and screw it in, now you have a nice, really solid attachment to hang, to screw your drywall and hang your drywall on. So just insulate this back area in here really well, and then run the insofast straight up to the floor joist if that's the look you're trying to achieve with flat, even walls all the way up. That's how I would approach that. Now. Going back to this particular picture, oh, yeah, one, one other thing. Well, I'll handle it here. One other thing. This area right in here at the top of the wall, this top of the wall, you see that wire in here? That gap in between there where it's, you have that trough back in here. This can become a really nice service or wire chase area where you can, you can run cable, a couple of wires, you can do drops to really power your house. But what I'd like to talk to you about is our typical layout on our InsoFast. We are starting with Full panel, two, four, six, seven. This wall happens to be seven foot high, so we have a full panel, full panel, full panel, and a cut panel up here. If you want to have that wire chase run along the top, and I do recommend it because you can pull wires and drop wires all the, all the way down, you can reverse that order instead of having a full panel down here have a cut panel. Let me demonstrate. What I'll do is I'll show you how to reverse that wall. So I'm going to set up a cutting station. And the InsoFast boxes make a great cutting station because they are very solid and <laughs> nice to work with. 
and we're going to cut a pan insofast panel in half. Now, I know it's seven a seven foot high wall, so I'm going to cut this panel in half. And on the panel itself, we have little indents built into the panel, little recessed areas for screw attachment. So if you were mechanically attaching this, the Tapcon screw would, would indent right in this indented area and be flush with the wall. So when you put the drywall on, it'll run smooth. But what that gives you is every six inches, this is six, 12, 18, 24. So you can divide the panel in half real easy. So you don't always have to use a tape measure and, and measure it. So let me do Let me do this, which I think is real important, because it'll show up better on camera. Since we're going to cut this in half, I'm going to give it a nice orange glow, nice line to follow. And remember, in so fast is rough framing. It's not fine carpentry. It's not finish work. You are going to be putting drywall or some kind of finished material on it. So don't be too fussy with uh, in so fast. I mean, it's easy to cut. If you make a mistake, don't worry about it. You can glue the panels back together. Now I'm going to turn my mic off right here. Hi, I'm back, and you didn't have to hear that loud noise. Okay, so there's our there's our cut that wasn't quite deep enough. There. Now. I would be terrible if I didn't insist that when you start with InsoFast, you keep that running bond because the inner lock of the panels helps flatten and tighten the wall and make it a lot flatter. So we're going to start our running bond by cutting this panel. And now we got our first panel we cut. We got our first panel that we just cut. And we'll set it down here. And we'll use our cut piece. Right there. So now we have our first half panel cut and start. Here would be our second panel, and that would tighten and put that all together. And because we're just starting this, I'm going to brace, brace this base with a concrete block so it doesn't kick out or fall. 
So that's a nice way to hold it together because if you go too fast, the wall is going to want to cup away. It's going to want to push away because the weight of the panels will push that first panel out. So if you brace it with a, with a, with a block, a book, a box, anything to get it started until the glue sets in about poof, uh, 45 minutes, it's got a first initial set. And then after 24 hours, you're good to go. You can hang drywall. So here's our first panel, our second panel, our, our second and a half panel, and then our final panel, and this electrical raceway along the top. So now you have a reversed wall set where you start low and go high. So thanks for watching. That'll be all for today. One last thing. Please like us. Please tell your friends. And thanks for watching.